All right, hello everyone and welcome to our Infor Tech TV Live. My name is Brad Stillwell and I'll be your host for the next hour as we discuss the interesting topic of top considerations that might get missed in the ERP selection process. So I want to welcome our audiences from YouTube and from LinkedIn as we're broadcasting on both today. If you are not familiar with how lives work, the idea is that this is supposed to be interactive and a fun way for you to engage with us. So we've got a great panel of experts that are gonna help us as we dive into today's topic, but the really interesting questions and content are gonna come from you, our live audience. So you can direct the conversation today by using the chat function to post questions, and we will provide that into the panel today. And speaking of our panel, let's get to know our experts that we have with us today. First up is our special guest, Sean Wendell, founder and managing principal from ERP Advisors Group. Sean, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone why you're so passionate about this topic? Oh, thanks, Brad. It's really a pleasure to be with you all today and really excited to see what the listeners have to say for questions. And I would just reiterate before I even tell you who I am, nothing's off limits. That's a little scary, I think. But <laughs> but we, as we know, we've done a good practice and I'm grateful to be part of a great panel of folks that really know ERP in and out. Um, and that's basically what my firm is about. Um, we're independent objective. We work with all the software vendors, but we help clients through the whole process of figuring out what do they really need to do about software, go through the whole selection, um, including the RFI process. And I'm really excited to share some of our lessons learned and best practices there. But then we also stick around for the implementation. So we don't do what N4PS or your partners do, but we do client-side implementation services. So we had uh, three go-lives here at the end of the year, and I've got a couple gashes on my back from the issues of cut over data migration and things like, oh my gosh, what just happened there? But, you know, our, we're really a very kind of in the trenches kind of firm, which um, that's why I started this firm was to be able to really help clients of all sizes, really mostly mid market up to maybe a billion or two, um, but really focused on, you know, the enterprises around the world that are making a difference out there. And we pretty much do anything to help them out with ERP. Excellent. Well, we're super glad to have you here today, Sean. Um, and next up is Mike Gay. Mike is VP and in Infor Customer Success. Um, Mike, why don't you take a minute, introduce yourself, tell everyone a little bit about your background and why you're passionate about the topic of ERP selections as well. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we're looking forward to a lively discussion here today. Uh, my name is Mike Gay. I've been at Infor just about three years. I go back with these systems before they were called ERP, MRP, MRP2. I was a user for a while. I was a vendor for a while. I was an integrator for a while. Before coming to Infor, I spent um, about seven and a half years at Gartner. I was a senior ERP strategy analyst at Gartner. I was the lead author of the last on-premise ERP Magic Quadrant and the lead author of the first cloud ERP Magic Quadrant at Gartner back in 2018. Um, I was also one of the original architects of what they call now the fourth era of ERP or composable ERP. So I was one of the people that helped build that concept. And I was been working with Infor since 2015 when they started moving to the cloud. And I came on board a few years ago to help Infor and Infor's customers actually deal with the new capabilities and the new challenges of SaaS ERP and composable ERP. And why am I why am I excited about this? I don't know. Some of the people I know think it's a psychological disorder if you've been working with ERP for 30 years and you're still excited about ERP. <laughs> but um, I actually do like this. I'm an ERP geek and I'm a, proud to admit it, I guess. So looking forward to a lively discussion here today. Thank you. Awesome. And we hope this can be uh, helpful for you to kind of get over that trauma. <laughs> <laughs> and I we are going to... <laughs> yeah, we are going to double click into that topic of errors of ERP and the concept of composability. So, uh, and lastly, rounding out our panel today is Rick Ryder, Vice President of Product Management at N4. Rick, why don't you introduce this to yourself and tell everyone why you're passionate about this topic? Yeah, um, thanks, Brad. And I hate that you guys made me go behind Mike because I'm sitting here like writing down like, how do I follow that he's been at, like he's <laughs> clearly the true expert in this, and I'm just the, the geeky guy maybe behind the scenes. But 
Yeah, so as Brad said, Rick Ryder, um, I've been at Infor as well for the past um, 11 years or so, really when we first started our, our cloud journey and specifically on the core technology side. So um, I'm responsible for product management and strategy when it comes to our, what we call our platform technology, which spans kind of all the cloud common services, anywhere from integration to data management to AIML to voice enabled services that all of our different solutions use, as well as third parties are able to use it in sort of a centralized way. Um, more recently, we've been focused a lot more on customer outcomes. Um, and that level of innovation is what I'm really passionate about. And this topic, I feel like fits very well into this discussion because from where, from our position, our engagement with, with customers is you're starting to see the decision criteria and what they're looking for in partners really starting to change. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited to dive into that a bit more. Awesome. Well, we're super happy to have you here and we will make sure that uh, Mike takes it easy on you today. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and jump into our topic for today. Uh, remember that those chat lines are open, so feel free to start posting your questions to our experts. Um, I will ask that if you can keep the questions on the topic of things that are going to get potentially missed in the ERP selection process, and please refrain from asking any specific te technical support type of questions along the way. So maybe as we wait for some of those questions to start coming in, let's start by providing a little bit of context. So uh, in many ERF uh, RFPs that I've seen lately, there still seems to be a heavy bias towards um, features and functionality, and oftentimes a lack of focus on business outcomes. So, Sean, I want to maybe kick it off and start with you. What guidance do you usually give around defining business outcomes or KPIs or targets around specific transformations that people are trying to achieve? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think what we have found over the years is every client's a little bit different on their ERP journey. We've actually developed what we call the, uh, the ERP awareness scale. And we can sort of plot where an individual company, organization, nonprofit, we work with lots of different types of, of organizations, but where they're at in terms of their understanding of ERP. And, and what we have found is for those organizations that understand that basically ERP is about transaction processing, right? Order to cash, procure to pay, all the basics that we've known about for years and years, some clients they really just care about the feature functionality. Hey, you know, our AP automation today is terrible and we want to know the differences. Okay, good. You know, we're going to do um, multiple rounds of demonstrations um, for our clients. And, you know, we have apologized to N4 and other vendors in the past that, you know, you're going to do three demos, but, you know, you're not going to do them unless we know you're a good fit too. And we have promised that and that's the truth. Because what happens is a client is coming off of sort of an old paradigm, whatever it is. We have clients that are coming off of mainframe, AS400, you know, maybe some of the old Microsoft, some of whatever it is. And they're used to thinking about their business systems one way. Mm -hmm. Then they start seeing demo, 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 right? And, and they oftentimes get confused because it's very confusing. Salespeople are really good. The solutions look good. So we say, look, let's get a script together. And, and the first demo, which we call a mini demo, is two hours. And you know what? We're going to ask the vendors to do high-level feature functionality and some of the really unique business requirements that the client has. Maybe the procurement in purchase to procure to pay is a button for them. They're doing tons and tons of invoices. They want some automation. Show it, right, for the first demo. Then... The second demo, we do kind of a scripted demo where it goes kind of um, bang, 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 bang in terms of the use case. But then we're also building in uh, business outcomes around that. So how are we really going to reduce our um, purchasing processing time by 10% with your system, right? We're pushing those requests out in our RFI. We're saying, here's the business goals that we have. Now for us, you know, we like our vendors. 
We, we want our vendors to want to do business with us because if they don't, we can't bring vendors to our clients. I mean, this is like pretty serious. Now, I'm not going to talk about my competitors, but when we do those scripts and those, those, those sort of business outcomes in the RFI, we ask our vendors what they can't do. We don't ask what they can do because, frankly, you know, I, I, I think probably Mike maybe has a few more years on me. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> since the mid-90s, I've been doing this. And, yeah. I mean, we're in 40 clients right now, right? So we see a lot of the same things over and over. So we know what the vendors can basically do. So if we can focus them towards here's the outcomes, here's the unique business requirements we want to see. Tell us if you can't do it. Give us an idea of pricing. That helps us to sort of set the stage with the client to say, okay, here's this spectrum. Now, we, when we do a short list, we keep it as short as possible. We don't want to take a ton of time to do a selection. The client will be absolutely certain. We guarantee that. But long story short, without those business outcomes that we lay out by major business process area, here's exactly what we want to get. Here's the script of functionality that we're looking for. Tell us what you can't do that are we often find that our vendors are like, you know what, I got a really good feel for how this is going to go. And, you know, <clears throat> their actions demonstrate that, to be totally honest with you, right? It should take a couple hours to fill out an RFI if you qualify. If you don't, you know, there's a lot more stuff going in there. So, you know, my firm is really built and just me, I guess, as a person who's been through, you know, the best of times and the worst of times with ERP, that I want to make it easy for everybody, as easy as it possibly can be. So without the business outcomes, it just becomes, you know, kind of a bit of a, you know, a bake off or, a, you know, well, this functionality worked this way over here versus that. That's not, that's not what everybody really needs, right? It really is about how can we change our business. So we tend to focus in that area for sure. No, absolutely. And I think uh, business transformation is, is really what it's all about, right? That, that's why we come to the table. That's why we do what we're doing. Um, so one thing I want to kind of touch on that Mike mentioned during the introduction is this concept of different eras of ERP um, mm -hmm. and where maybe the focus and the functionality has shifted over time. So, Mike, what era of ERP are we in today and, and what do you think defines that current era? OK, so we're in what we coined the fourth era of ERP. If you go back historically you know, when I started working with these systems, and yes, I probably have a few years on you, Sean, um, started off with MRP, right? Material Requirements Planning back in the late 70s, early 80s, when inventory carrying costs were ridiculous because interest rates were in the teens, you know, 14, 15, 16% interest. Um, and that morphed quickly into MRP too. So it went from just inventory management to shop floor control, work in process, scheduling, blah, blah, blah. And that morphed into the early 90s, expanding into things like CRM, HCM, and so forth. And Gartner coined the term enterprise resource planning, ERP, to encompass all of those capabilities. So that was really the third era of ERP. And about four or five years ago, as vendors started moving to the cloud, as technology became a bigger part of the landscape, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about enterprise application platforms shortly, but... When you go back and you look at that, the fourth era of ERP, really you need to start thinking differently about these systems. And what we were trying to do at Gartner was, you know, Sean mentioned this, shake people out of the thought process that they're dealing with what they bought 20, 25 years ago, right? I mean, the systems people were buying 20 years ago were to solve data inconsistency, process inconsistency, you know, let the, CIA, the CFO and the CEO get a good answer when they want it to know, like, how much money did we make last quarter? And they didn't get four answers from four different people. They're running four different systems that weren't integrated properly. So <clears throat> it's really the fourth era. And one of the things, you know, I have a friend who's uh, now at <clears throat> a competitor who um, had a great <laughs> talent for doing things. We were sitting around trying to talk about this. And I said, we've got to get people to stop thinking about the systems they were using 20 years ago. They're not having the same problems they had 20 years ago. They're not dealing with the same issues in the next five or 10 years that they were dealing with five or 10 years, you know, 20 years ago. And so he came up with this great visual graphic, which was um, a cassette tape that's unwound on a tabletop with a pencil stuck through one of the spindles, right? So, you know, and the, the caption was, don't try to solve the problems you had 20 years ago. And I felt old when I showed that. Usually when I showed that picture during a presentation, people would snicker 
And one of the programmers in IT said to me, well, I know that's a cassette tape, but what's the pencil for? And I'm like, okay, this kid's never used a cassette tape. Now I feel old. Um, <laughs> but when you're looking at it from the perspective of what people need to think about when they're selecting ERP systems, I think Sean touched on this. If you can't do the basic order to cash, procure to pay, hire to retire processes, you're not in business anymore because people are going to eat your lunch during a demo. Okay, they're just going to kill you. Um, so what you really need to be thinking about is the fact that applications themselves are changing. They're getting more intelligent. Process automation is becoming table stakes. If you can't do process automation, same deal. You know, when somebody looks at a demo of you know a modern technology application versus one that really has the old workflow that you have to manually modify to do something like that, you're not going to make it. And the big thing that we were pushing at Gartner the last few years was user experiences. And I think that's where, you know, when you start talking about digital transformation, you know, a good example, it's a very simple one is um, I want to reduce my onboarding time from four weeks to three days. Okay. So you think about the paper processes involved, the emails involved. No, 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 no. That should all be automated should leverage social media, should leverage new technology, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the challenges that Sean and his team would have, and the challenge we had at Gartner was, look, don't think of cloud ERP or SaaS ERP as just the latest technology upgrade of your ERP system. You need to think about these things completely differently. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, I love the fact that, you know, in this new era, we're talking uh, beyond just feature functionality. We're talking about business outcomes. We're talking about uh, how do we eliminate manual processes and use more automation. But there's another topic that I don't see uh, really addressed as much in RF RFPs, and that's really the, the broader concept of innovation, right? Or uh, a customer's long-term goals around how they want to deliver innovation. So Rick, maybe you can talk a little bit about how folks should be thinking about the topic of innovation when it comes to ERP selection. And then maybe we can touch on, you know, Sean or Mike as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good segue into, I was taking some notes on, on what Mike was talking about, how he went through, how it grew and how eventually in the nineties it got into CRM and you could just hear him go through how the footprint of the enterprise continues to increase, mm -hmm. increase, increase, increase. Now, You've seen a lot of vendors say, okay, well, I can do all of that. Let me give you one out of the box solution. But now the, the market says that I've got best of breed in an application space and all these different things. So what that's created is um, a real need for composability, I guess, is the way to say that is, is, you know, Mike's talking about it's expected. Like if I, if I buy a solution with AP, with AP, it's got to have automation baked in and it's no longer about the feature function of AP. It's who can automate it the best. But then I'm going to say, well, AP is really connected to all your other business processes. Are those on the same <laughs> systems? Are they not? So what, I, what I'm starting to see or what I'm, I guess, anticipating the market moving towards is that composability is going to become real. Like we've kind of talked about it. Gartner's been talking about it. They're always on the forefront of these types of things. But that automation concept, why wouldn't you do that centralized, right? So I can, I can use it and I can tap into it. I've got the resources. I've got the knowledge that can do it on any given system at a rapid pace. That's what we're starting to see customers want more and more of. Because when customers ask for innovation, like, yeah, we can say innovation as a great marketing term or whatever. But if we say, um, hey, we've got this solution that can increase your sales by 5%. And here's how it's got some AI and ML in it. Our experience has been as you go do that once and the customer goes, oh, great. Can I do something similar in this department? Can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? That's the real repetitive, tangible value of what we like to call the customer journey of innovation is that it's continuous now. It's not just a one off. Let me go buy this innovation. I think because when you mix in, again, the expanding complex footprint and this concept of required composability, that composability, in my opinion, is there for the innovation. Right. So, um, yeah, I well, think so that's, you, you, you know, know kind of and, and you mentioned the topic I, composability. So. <laughs> I want to. Yeah. And if I could, play. Brad, I'd like, I'd like to jump in here for a second because <laughs> Rick just mentioned a couple of really important points. And so I want to say a couple of things and then flip it to Sean for his input on this. Um, when cloud started to become a reality back in 2015, 2016, 2017, you had HCM, CRM in the cloud and finance was starting to move to the cloud. We started to get a lot of questions about, well, 
do I have to buy HR finance and supply chain from the same vendor anymore? Because the apps are more flexible. The technology for integration is better. And I'm like, yeah, you can, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And what you really want to focus on is where's my value proposition, right? Just because I can stick things together easier doesn't mean I want IT people spending all their time making the AP system, talk to the purchasing system, talk to the supply chain system, right? It's where's my value proposition? And that's going to be different for every firm. And, and Sean touched on an important point, which is not everybody's starting from the same place, right? Mm -hmm. So it, I may, you know, when I was at Gartner, I got to be careful here who I was talking to, but I was talking to a large company that distributes household products, all right? And their supply chain system was something that they had spent decades configuring and customizing and tweaking to a fairly well. So for them, replacing an on-premise HR financial system, you know, and a CRM system was fine, but they didn't want to lose that capability in their supply chain planning. And so you really have to look at that and you have to look at the innovation piece in terms of applications are getting smarter. Like in what we used to say at Gartner was, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning are things that are going to evolve rapidly over the next five to 10 years. You don't need an answer from your vendor of what they can do specifically. But Sean touched on this. What is the vendor investing in? Where are they putting their R&D dollars in? Because you don't want to find out five years from now, you bought, you bought software from a vendor that's really not paying any attention to AI and machine learning. That's not going to be a good thing. So I wanted to kind of flip that back to Sean for like how he helps customers who are stuck in the kind of, I need this feature functionality mindset away back to what do I need to be thinking about for the next five or 10 years? It's a great question, Mike. Um, and uh, we're literally in the middle of it right now with about a half a billion dollar building supply company, which um, I'm, we're going to get into this. Like, I love this kind of stuff, right? Without throwing any names out. But, but our client is coming off of an old AS400 system, family run business. They've grown through acquisition, lots of organic growth. They're looking to what to do to get to that 750 or even a billion range. And they're going to get there. there. There's no question. The strategy is there. The operations in terms of sort of the, the, again, the organic growth, it's all there. Except the way they do everything is manual and it's killing them. And they're losing people because of it. And they can't hire younger people who are going to come in and say, I refuse to do my work that way. You know, you want some business drivers, people on the call for new ARP? I just gave them to you. Oh, that's like 90% of the folks we're talking to. Right there, you can justify a business case for a new ERP on that. But we're working with the client, and um, especially in that particular vertical or sub-vertical, right, or, or micro-vertical, you've got distribution and then building supplies. There's a lot of solutions in the market that have been around for a long time in that area. And oftentimes we have different constituents, stakeholders throughout the organization that have different drivers for how they want to make a decision on ERP. It's very easy for somebody near the top who's known lots of people in the industry for years to say, well, I'm just going to go with this because that's what all my peers do. Okay, fine. Except that the micro vertical solution is uh, 30 years old. Um, they're declining on their employees their R&D is going down and the people that wrote it don't have a transition plan in place. There's no succession. They didn't sell out or whatever, right? And we have had, I mean, I personally have talked to software vendors, these owners to say, how, how can I bring my client to you? Like, I, I, I mean, this is what I do for a living. And, and the clients come back to me um, and say, you know, you took us down the wrong path. Like, you know, my wife works in my business. I work in the business. Yeah, we have 25 people throughout this business, but like, this is like a big deal. So, you know, when I have those kinds of conversations with these software vendors, you know, sometimes it opens up their mind, right? Because look, you got a software company, you got a big customer base, it's very valuable. And, and there's a reason why we like it when a smaller software vendor gets bought by a bigger software vendor because their, their continuity, they have a plan now for where to go in the future. That plan may be your smaller app gets sunsetted and you're forced on to another solution. You know, we won't name any names. Um, that's fun too. <laughs> but, but the key thing that I'm trying to say here is feature functionalities from these micro vertical solutions are spot on. It's like they wrote it for my industry or for me, because guess what they did? 
But very often the technology platform that Rick talked about, right, the underpinnings that really create this interoperability and this composable situation that the client didn't have that problem in the past, like Mike said, now they all do. Every client we're working with is ultimately coming down to their industry is either being Ubered or they want to be the Uber in their industry. Steel distribution, building supplies. I don't care what it is. They all know that technology transformation isn't just going to happen. It's happening. And if they don't get ahead of it, they're going to die. And they know that. So I, that's why I've, I've said this. I'll continue to say this, that I believe... Like, like Mike said, I haven't been around as long as Mike has, but I'm, so I'm curious to get your thoughts here. I really, really believe that the next 10 years of ERP are going to make the last 50 look like a speck of dust. I really believe that, that the industry, the vendors, I mean, I look very, very, very closely at what M4 is doing all the time, right? You guys are in several of our deals right now, right? We've done lots of deals with you guys. We love you guys, but we're always watching the strategy of what you're doing. And it's a diverse business. There's a lot going on. Same with all the rest of the vendors. So we know what's happening. We know what's happening with our customers. We know what's driving their digital transformation. Um, and then we're living in demos day in and day out, right? My team's probably in five demos literally today. So we see what the partners are doing. We see how the products are getting pitched. We see even through the implementation and the go live, what benefits our clients are getting. All of these factors between the software vendors, customers, sort of industry trends, underlying technology with cloud. I'm super excited to talk more about this AI and machine learning stuff, which I've always been like, whatever, until I saw, you know, really what's happening with this chat, the chat um, GPT stuff, how close we are to there being a lot mm -hmm. of value there. Excited to hear what you guys are doing around that too, Rick. But I mean, I'm stoked because, you know, uh, I had a guy that um, uh, said to me, you know, in 10 years, your business, you'll probably be out of business because no one's going to need you. Right. And um, there are some vendors in the market. Again, I can't throw anybody under the bus on the call that basically sell their software extremely cheap. Now their implementation is super high. And maybe one day the world goes that way, you know, like mm -hmm. desktop apps. I don't know. But I don't think so. Right. I think ERP is something that is so specific to customers that you have all these factors now. You have customers who are more aware. Again, goes back to what Mike said. Well, we just need to replace what we got 20 years ago. And then they see a couple demos and then they start talking to folks like us and they're like, oh my gosh, we could be the Uber, right? Or, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, now I see that my <clears throat> is the Uber and I have to keep track of them. So I just see, you know, I'm very, very bullish on the future, despite the kind of economic, whatever we're going through right now. But and I'm just going to be honest, it's driven by you guys. That's why I wanted to do this call with Infor. Because I see the investment that the stronger ERP vendors are doing, like you all, you know, Rick's been there. He's got a big team of people, Brad, you know, and Mike, that, um, you know, if a vendor isn't investing in their technology platform as much as they are feature function, they're going to die. No question. Yeah. So one thing, you know, Sean, you, you said it, Rick, you said it, Mike, you said it, you've all used the term composability at some point in this conversation. Um, I'd love to understand what, how each of you defines what composability means. And maybe we'll start with Mike since uh, he might've been there at the genesis of the, the, the coining of the term. <laughs> yeah. So there's two things I want to say about that. The first one is what it is not. OK, and what it is not is an excuse to just start breaking apart your entire ERP system into all the functional areas, HR, finance, procurement, so on and so forth. I was talking to a client about this one time and trying to explain the concept. And he said something back to me and I said, that is a great analogy. I'm stealing it. And here's the analogy. He said, so what you're saying is I should think of my ERP system like a basketball covered in Velcro that I can slap new things on and take them off and replace them very quickly and easily without having to worry about disrupting the core system. Bingo. That's a very simple but very elegant explanation of what it means. And what it means to do that, and this is where I kind of pass it to Rick because he can talk about this more than I can. I'm very much a technical geek here, but I can get myself into trouble very quickly. So what I will say is this, one of the differentiators of a platform, like if you're looking at a vendor's platform, which you should be talking about, 
Well, there's the AI machine learning component. There's things like the digital voice assistant component. The one of the things that really, you know, differentiates Enforce platform in the marketplace is that it's built to service the ERP and the enterprise applications that we're selling. So things like metadata capabilities, security, data security are mm -hmm. inherently in, you know, they're inherited when you start building applications within that platform because it's designed to enable that. So I'll go back to the value proposition. Composability means you're getting an ecosystem, not just an ERP, but an ecosystem from the vendor that includes the, the technology platform, the enterprise application platform, the tools to do low code, no code application development and integration that are basically designed to let you extend and integrate with the core ERP system. So I'm going to flip it over to Rick and let him talk a little bit about the platform and those things that I just mentioned here. Yeah, and maybe I'll end up getting myself in trouble, Mike, because um, <laughs> I, I, look, I, I think even the term composability from when you guys kind of coined it and you had all these different uh, like architecture type things to help people grasp the concept of it is even evolving now because now mm -hmm. I get questions all the time of around microservices, right? That's another term that people have different definitions of, but what it's starting to highlight is the competition is real and growing. So maybe even the definition of ERP is changing, mm -hmm. but so even like the composability, maybe it's not, well, I would challenge, is it, is it, I've got this ERP that's the Velcro basketball analogy, right? But maybe it's like, oh, but maybe I need 10 tennis balls because those might need to be interchangeable, but the Velcro is still the same, right? You're using that in a consistent way. That's how I kind of think about like platform playing a, a role in this and, and what, mm -hmm. um, you guys have some in, in your in your in your previous um, time with Gartner had coined some terms around what is that centralized thing? Is it is it EAP? What is it? Right. Um, but I think that's going to be the catalyst, because when it comes to why, why would I want to do um, things like AI, AI ML, um, hyper automation or just basic business automation um, integrations? Why would I want to do those things different ways? per application that I have, regardless of the vendor that it's coming from. Because likely if you're doing that, if you really look, especially the big enterprises that we work with, if we go and look at the contract values and the amount of effort and IP and things that they're putting in different systems and how that can even be centralized in a way to where it's cost effective, faster, all these different things. That's that new market that I think at least um, Brad and I are so passionate about exploring more because I think that's going to be like the, the 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 it factor when it comes to choice for for a lot of vendors out there so mike you mentioned security for just a moment there and we've gotten several questions in the chat about the topic of security um how do you guys maybe address or give guidance as it relates to security when people are moving from maybe traditionally on-premise type of solutions to something new that's in the cloud mm -hmm. It's a good question. So I'll start and then I'll flip it back to, um, to Rick and then Sean. So one of the things that happened when cloud became a standard thing, if you will, around 2016, 2017, we started to get a lot of questions about security. And here's the thing that there were a lot of, there was actually a security team at Gartner. And one of the experts there had a paper that he wrote, which is called the cloud is secure. You're using it securely. Now, my brother is actually a cybersecurity expert. So we have some real interesting conversations about enterprise applications and security. But when you look at it from that perspective, Amazon can spend a lot more on security than any one company can spend on security, right? right? So when we have the Amazon platform, we're leveraging all that Amazon R&D for security and all the other things that Rick just mentioned, and we're incorporating it into the application. And, and Rick touched on something really important. And I first wanna say this, if you ask 10 Gartner analysts to describe composable ERP, you're probably going to get six or seven different answers. Okay. So <laughs> there is no one answer for any of this stuff. But I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is when you're looking at it in the context of what we're discussing here, which is like ERP selection and what do people start to think about when they're looking at a vendor, Rick touched on something important, which was um, one of the things that we told people is like, you might have three or four different integration tools. In fact, this was one of the big discussions I got <laughs> into with a lot of our larger customers was 
you know, they buy Workday. Workday's got an integration tool. They buy Oracle for this. Oracle's got an integration tool. They buy SAP for this. Or SAP's got an integration tool. Oh, and by the way, they've got this other integration tool that they bought as an I, a platform, IAS platform, right? And so what you're looking at in this, and, and one of the things that I used to tell people is, look, you want to make sure you're directing your resources to value-added activity and avoid where you can having valuable IT and business analyst type resources just making stuff work because mm -hmm. that's not adding a lot of value. You really need to look at a bigger picture and say, what are the outcomes I want? What is the value proposition I have? And Rich, Rich touched on this, but I'll say it again. One of the things that's going to happen here is you're going to get new experiences, new applications, new capabilities arriving from places outside your organization, right? If you'd have gone to a taxi driver eight years ago, the biggest cab company in New York and said, what are your plans for digital transformation? They would have said, what's digital transformation? Ask them what Uber is, and they all know what Uber is, okay? Mm -hmm. They had no choice that got forced on them from outside. There are going to be things emerging in the market where you're going to see organizations, no matter what vertical you're in, public sector, manufacturing, food and beverage, blah, 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 where some new capability is going to pop into the market. The organizations are going to be the most successful are the ones that partnered with a vendor that anticipated that sort of thing and have an infrastructure in place to let you adopt that very, very quickly without disrupting your operations. That's to me what composability means. OK, <laughs> and I'll just flip it back over the fence to the other guys. Maybe I'll jump in. Um, you know, we we look at sort of ERP as a conceptual framework, which nobody understands mm -hmm. what that means, um, except for guys like Mike and Rick and Brad. <laughs> but but it is true though that that you know we take we look at an organization and we sort of uh, we borrowed this along the way from some of our big four roots um, or big three now. But you have to look at the organization and say, okay, what what is the what are the processes high level that we do? Manufacturers have sort of an ecosystem, business process ecosystem, we call it. Uh, services firms, government agencies, whatever, different kind of ecosystem, and and we start drawing. Literally, we draw pictures and we draw circles around. Okay, for you, ERP is this. Oh, for you, it's that. Or hey, maybe there's one system that can do it all. Okay, or there's a bunch of systems that can do each individual function, or maybe there's some hybrids in between. I mean, that is baked into our methodology. Like I bang on my consultant's head, like, you know, all in one hybrid, best of breed. What are we going to recommend for our client and why? And, you know, that, that, that concept though, we always end up with hybrid solutions, but we have to look to see. Um, and it also, I guess I should say it helps our clients because They'll usually go out and start talking to folks, vendors, before they call us. The best, our best prospects have have worked with uh, vendors a little bit, and they're confused as heck, right? And they're willing to spend some money to get some help, and that's what we do. So they don't know that if they go with a Coupa, right, or versus uh, you know Enforce purchasing, that it's different. Mm -hmm. We're solving different problems here, folks. You know, and so when mm -hmm. we start drawing these pictures, folks really understand, like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So that's why we say it's sort of a conceptual framework. And once we decide what's within that framework, what, what are the, uh, the processes that we want to automate? Now we can go to market and we can take a look at the solutions that are out there. And I will tell you, Mike, I couldn't agree with you anymore that the more technology platforms our clients have, the more the value goes down, right? You're spending a lot of money keeping the lights on and you're not going to be able to compete. That's just the reality. So, you know, we really focus on, you know, simple technology platform, robust technology platform, and the kinds of things like, you know, workflow automation, um, chat within the solutions, a lot of things you guys have done, a lot of things some other vendors have done too. It really serves as the basis for the whole enterprise. So then if we do, you know, salespeople sometimes can tend to be a little religious about the software they use. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes we run into that. It's fine. Let them do it. Right. But we've got to be able to plug in. We have to have those integrations and we have to not just build these for the first time ourselves. As soon as that happens with our clients, man, the risk goes through the roof. We mark the integrations bright orange and say, there's a chance here that when we're writing these integrations on an iPass or with something else, that uh, we're going to miss it because it's never been done before. See, that that is the unusual thing. This is a nugget I would love everybody to understand. I mean, everybody. 
in your given implementation, so let's say that building supply company that I mentioned, half billion, been around for 70 years, right? Let's say they're going to go from an old solution to M4, whatever. Nobody has ever implemented for that company, for that company's business processes from that old app to this new M4 app before ever. It's the first time this has ever happened. Every single implementation is that way. Now, there's people like us that really want to do, and you guys, all of us here on this call, want to do the right thing for the client, and we build out technology platforms, and we've learned lessons, and blah, 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 blah. But you get into this sort of like implementation side where we live, and data migration is a nightmare, and you know, deciding how do we want the procure-to-pay process to really work. Well, let's go ask the controller. Well, let's go ask purchasing, and let's go ask the CEO. We got three different answers. Who's going to get the right answer mm-hmm. here? But those are the problems we want clients working on, you know, really identifying this is how we want our business process to run. Get the basic automation in place. Let's have a technology platform that's strong, but doesn't require all of our attention just to keep the lights on. Um, And then we've got it right, because it really is a crawl, walk, run approach you have to take with the RP. It's a gradient scale, like I said earlier. And if you don't have that basics in, you don't have that technology platform that you can leverage. You know, when your customers or your vendors come to you and say, you know, look, I can offer you some discounts if we can start doing business more electronically. Oh, well, that's EDI. That's easy. We've been doing that. No, no, no. You don't understand what I'm saying. I'm going to start building my forecasts off your inventory in real time. EDI ain't going to be the solution for that, guys. Like we got to get tightly coupled here and you're running on a platform that's not modern. You're screwed. So it's really, you know, this composable apps, you know, we like our slogans in, in the enterprise software space for sure. But the real truth about it is that, again, <clears throat> we're just on the precipice of a whole lot of automation. You know, you've got lots of people that are unavailable. We don't have we have a talent shortage of people in, in our in our world. I mean, this isn't just the country for sure. So we're going to have to automate the basic stuff so that people can come up and learn more and do more. We do have cybersecurity risk unequivocally. I have had many clients that have gotten hit with attacks and it is it's disastrous. It's the worst thing that can happen. Then they move to the cloud solution and it, the ERP is not going to be the target anymore. They can still run their business even if the rest of the apps go down. Then you also have, again, sort of this composable world where, you know, it's if we're going to do business with the large guys, they're already demanding, the Walmarts are already demanding you're going to do electronic business with them. But we're seeing that really come down to that mid-market space as well. So, you know, it is a little bit of marketing fluff, but I'm telling you, if you're not thinking about this stuff now, you're going to miss the boat later when it really matters. You know, yeah. you touched on a, I'm sorry, oh, Brad. Go ahead, Mike. No, you touched on a couple of things there, Sean, that I want to kind of elaborate on. The first one is when we first came up with this concept that's now being called composable, um, we were trying to take ERP right out of the name. <laughs> we, we first called it enterprise business capabilities. Okay. And it kind of resonated with some people at Gartner because they were talking about packaged application capabilities as the way things are going to start being deployed. Um, however, the the market impetus and the the wave of behind ERP was just too hard. They couldn't get rid of it. We were trying to make them get rid of it, but they, they wouldn't do it. And the reason it's important is because of some of the things you touched upon. You have to look at the whole ecosystem, right? And it's yeah. really different. It was really interesting listening to you talk because Within Gartner, one time I was at an event and there was a bunch of us sitting around and we were getting into an argument about what ERP meant, you know, in 2020, 2019, whatever. And um, I sat there listening to everything. Everybody asked everybody except the ERP strategy analyst. Moi. <laughs> and so finally, one of the senior VPs said, so, Mike, you're the ERP guy. What do you think? And I said, you know what? The first question I ask somebody is when I'm talking to them, how do you define ERP? Mm-hmm. That's I ask the customers because mm-hmm. it varies widely. Right between what they're really looking for. And one of the things that's really important is not to think of composable as like a a technology that lets you plug one thing into another. It's this whole concept that you're looking at a a big ecosystem surrounding the ERP. And a lot of that stuff isn't even remotely related to ERP, but I'm gonna be dealing with it, right? So, and you you were talking and I was thinking, if you just think of a simple analogy between two organizations, I'm a manufacturing company in the Midwestern US somewhere or wherever, and I'm 
three, four hundred million dollar organization. What I need for HCM and payroll, I'm probably going to outsource to ADP. I, mm -hmm. I don't need to buy and manage an HR system. I'm just going to outsource it. What I need, inventory management, manufacturing, supply chain, distribution. That's what I need. So that's what I'm going to buy. Right. So what I want is I want to be dealing with a vendor that will let me buy that and just plug whatever I want for HCM and AP into it seamlessly without me having to spend a lot of time and effort on it. To me, that's part of what compose that's part of what composability means. The rest of it is really how do I basically take advantage of new technologies in the market? And does my vendor give me the ability to start leveraging those without having to make a massive investment? Exactly. We have some really interesting case studies at Infor where people bought part of our suite. And when you buy part of our cloud suite, you get the platform that it runs on. And the platform has capabilities a lot of these people don't even know they already have that they can leverage to get good things. I'm gonna let Rick talk about a couple of those in a minute. But one other thing I wanna say, you touched on something really important, Sean, which is organizations, and I have to admit that we're also guilty of this, but uh, we're not as bad as some other vendors. Still, their service delivery and their sport is stuck in an on-premise mindset. I'm delivering the system to you, I'm gonna set it up and I'm gonna walk away. And that does not work mm -hmm. in this fourth era of ERP, it does not work. You know, SaaS is a completely different animal. It's not like an on-premise system where I install it and I do an upgrade four years later. I'm getting constant updates to the system. I'm getting constant new feature functionality coming out. And I have to have a vendor that has a service delivery organization and a support organization and a partner organization yeah that understands that and can help me really get value from what I bought from my vendor. I wanna kinda, of, there's a couple of really good stories here. I wanna give Rick a couple of minutes to talk about some of the customers that have bought our applications that really leveraged the platform, not even knowing what they had when they got the platform. Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing that I just wanna maybe hit on and Brad's gonna kill me because it might start on a whole other topic, but one thing that I'm hearing from a, from a lot of you is it feels like there's like a culture aspect that's evolving here within organizations too. And I, what I don't quite know if it's, if it's their software systems and the ecosystems is forcing them to change their mentality and culture, which in turn changes their buying habits or if it's chicken and egg type situation. But that's one thing that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about is to Mike's point, a lot of the customers that we've been able to work with and provide some proof points on there, we've seen a lot of cultures that they're hungry for transformation and potentially hungry for that transformation even before they're on their new ERP or application. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a few examples to where um, we've been moving a customer from on-premise to uh, multi-tenant. And they said, you know what? I'm going to start to wire some of these things together for myself in a span of two weeks. They had some in-context intelligent applications running against their on-premise system using our multi-tenant platform. Like that's the sort of flexibility that we can give that's giving them I think it's on the magnitude of 10% more additional sales and customer satisfaction per year. Um, and we've got countless other AI related, we've got voice um, related um, interactions within the healthcare space now to where it, you think about the, the key things about like patient care and how there's been big turnover with nurses. How can I make their jobs easier? Well, not exactly making their jobs easier by having to interact with a big monolith system in a lot of different cases, right? So what if I can provide that extensibility or access by saying, hey, you've got an Alexa device using Alexa for business or whatever the mechanism might be that I can say, hey, where is something? Can I immediately do the fulfillment? So you see where you're going from like inventory to supply chain very quickly in healthcare, which are two different processes. They're connected, but two different processes. But now I can enable a nurse to be the catalyst to do that within a matter of 10 seconds. That's the level of transformation that we're really starting to see. Um, there has been a lot of no one wants to be the first one. Um, and that's why, I mean, we've taken kind of the approach that um, Infor has invested quite heavily in doing this on behalf of customers to prove a lot of these different things out and ROI. We call them our showcase accounts um, and we're going to continue to do that. But as soon as you start to see one, they get hungry for more. Um, mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of different examples to Mike's point to where um, it's been challenging. Well, what comes first now? So, so Sean, you were talking about um, it's a crawl, walk, run, I think was mm -hmm. how you coined it. Well, now we've been seeing some interesting cases where that crawl even starts at sort of the anchor in the cloud, which becomes platform because yeah. that allows them to, while they're migrating and doing all these things, they can start to see some ROI very, very quickly. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Rick, it's, it, it, it's, this is something that I think is not just for our listeners, but but also from the folks from from N4 to really understand too that in my selection processes, right? I mean, I'm busting my you know what, right? To get our clients, you know, 80, 85 percent of that discussion is business outcomes. How's that? How are the apps going to support my business? Just getting people to understand, like, holy macro, my whole world's going to change here. And I'm okay with that. And it's good, right? A fraction of the time is spent on, okay, let's talk about technology roadmap and platform, right? Okay, basic stuff, right? Security, we've got, you know, automation, workflow, reporting, analytics, et cetera, like the burst stuff. We love that stuff from you guys, et cetera, et cetera. What we don't do is exactly what you just said. Right. And we need to do this more. And I really, really suggest for everybody on this call, when you're engaging with vendors or if you're on the vendor side, you have to talk about the platform now because it will every single time outweigh the feature functionality. And this is a big miss in a lot of selection processes, frankly, that, mm -hmm. you know, we just don't get into Okay, so you know your micro vertical. This is what we normally see, uh, customer, and this is how I can use our platform to get you there. Whoa! I, first off, I didn't understand what you said. You might have to tell me that a couple times, right? If I'm the customer, <laughs> um, it's just the truth, right? But then once they start to cognize and understand that you know this transformation isn't just going to be through feature functionality, that it is exactly like you said. And then it just naturally happens, right? We had an M4 customer that um, uh, looking for transformation, wanted to be a kind of a, um, a kind of first player in their industry to do a lot of automation, not just sell to their customers, but sell to their competitors. Very much a, a, a low margin um, kind of a business, but high transaction. And so they were looking to build the platform to be able to expose data and get it out there, right? So we were looking at e-commerce solutions, even EDI, and, and kind of once we got the base platform in place, and it just naturally started to happen. It was beautiful, right? It was a beautiful discussion because it wasn't like other vendors where it was like, oh, wow, that project was six times over budget and I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> I don't like those conversations. So those are, those are hopefully of days of yore, right? especially cloud it makes it more approachable, but now we get the app in place. And then I do think that that evolution is something that you guys need to talk more about, right? I see some links over here on the side. I think those are really good to see that. And then, you know, it's not just the marketing and sales side. It truly is when you're buying an ERP, you are investing in a partner that you're basically going to build your business on. I don't care what anybody says, right? You can go buy other companies. You can build, your own machines, buy machines, you can hire more people around the world, whatever it is. But we've seen this over and over and over that these enterprise service platforms, these, these ERPs, right? Maybe I need to change the name of my business to Composable Apps uh, Advisors Group, we'll see. Um, <laughs> um, I'll put that in mind. Um, but I think it would be CRAP, now that probably wouldn't work. Anyway, um, <laughs> the bottom line though is you know, dig in, you know, from the client side, dig in with your technology partners to really get the practical side of the platform and what you can do. And I also think from the vendor side, continue to push that messaging. And I love, again, I mean, we work with everybody, independent objective, but I really do feel like, you know, you all have done a very good job of investing in the platform with pragmatic investments right? Not just going off and building a whole bunch of RPA that, you know, one ginormous customer cares about, right? So I think that's something I would say based on everything we've said here, guys, is, you know, again, I'm super excited for what's to come, but that technology platform is what's going to differentiate my clients going forward into the future. How fast can they transform their business is really dependent on the work you guys are doing. So we've only got about five minutes left, but um, I want to finish with a question and kind of preface it. I think a lot of what you, you guys have said so far is that really the killer app today in ERP is time to value and how quickly you can innovate and iteratively innovate, right? Because mm -hmm. pivoting has become the new normal. So if we think about future trends, 
um, what isn't maybe mainstream yet, what do you think people should start thinking about in the evaluation process that is kind of where the puck is going? So I'll, I'll, I'll throw one out there and I'll, I'll give you a comment. Um, we give a lot of presentations on this concept, trying to get people to change how they think about this sort of thing. And one of the things that we, we did was we quoted uh, something from Aldous Huxley. He's the guy who wrote Future Shock back in like the 70s. And he said, the illiterate of the next 20 years won't be people that don't know how to read and write. It's people that don't know how to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And it means you've got to adjust that mindset that what I knew as a truism today is not going to be a truism five years from now. And you see it all around you with different things. I mean, just look at how you used to do Christmas shopping eight years ago. How many people did a lot of their Christmas shopping on Amazon.com? Guilty, right? So, I mean, th there's things that are going to change the way we do everything in our lives. And from an enterprise application system standpoint, you need an enterprise vendor and enter enterprise system that's looking forward, even if you don't know exactly what it's going to be, you're, uh, you're building the platform and the infrastructure, but internally to the organization, it's been kind of touched on here, I want to actually say it. People are really important and investing in the people skills so that your organization knows how to become more agile, it's overused term almost, more adaptable, easily changing things. And I'll just give you a good instance. I have kids in the, you know, the late teens all the way up to you know, almost 30 years old. You know what their loyalty to an app is? Non-existent. If they are using something and something better emerges, they'll drop it like a stone and just start using the new application. <laughs> Those are people going to be making app application decisions in, in terms of buying and using applications for the next five to 10 years. So you need to think about that. Rick? Rick, maybe you want to yeah. look over um, the time horizon? Yeah, so uh, Mike talked about people, and I think it's because um, I'm passionate about this area, so maybe I'm biased, but I think you're going to hold, you're going to see uh, more mainstream people wanting to do what I call business simulations. So you you look you look at like um, uh, uh, business process today, and how can we do it more intelligently, right? And process mining and all these different things. But at the end, there's there's a comfort level and curve that goes along with that, and I think you're going to see. Um, people entering the workforce that are going to have ideas and how can they express that and make the business better? Because that's what gets people really passionate, right? So kind of that hyper automation theme is a bit of a marketing term today, but it's, it's more philosophical in my mind of, okay, I can automate it this way. How can I continue that journey, right? You want to empower your people and employees to do that. Because I think those two things, the simulations and, and automation is going to be something that doesn't, it, it's not a one-time thing. So kind of back to the selection criteria, I would be asking uh, uh, the, the companies that, that I might be prospecting with, right? Is like, okay, great. You're showing me how you do AP today. How can you continuously make me better at this? And I'm not talking about product roadmap, by the way. I'm not at all. Because I think a big misconception that there is, is that personal, you don't have personalization in the cloud. You have massive personalization in the cloud. It just comes without customization. Um, and what I mean by that is because of my data, my process, my nimbleness of how I can potentially augment a business process quickly, that's massive personalization that even if we sell something to a food and beverage customer, food and beverage customer A can be massively different from B and they can be highly differentiated against one another of how they do that. But guess what? They could be running the same ERP. It's just mm -hmm. that it's got that level of personalization. So I think that's what you're going to see a little bit more mainstream, but it, a good point by Mike. It's all wrapped around how do you enable your people better? And back to that culture thing that I'm passionate about. Excellent. So today we, we focused on uh, composability. We focused on uh, transformation. We focused on innovation. Um, and we focused on, you know, really upskilling resources to what the processes of tomorrow are going to look like so that they can take advantage of these innovations. And so Really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to, to walk us through that. So looks like we've reached the end of our time today. Uh, so with that, we'll end the session and thank our panel for their great ideas and suggestions. Uh, very much appreciated, everyone. If you want to learn more about the process of selecting your next ERP, I would highly encourage you to check out our friends at ERP Advisors Group. Uh, you'll see a link to their website below. And to get notified about future lives, 
please like and subscribe to our Infor Technology YouTube channel and our Infor corporate page on LinkedIn. So thank you everyone for watching and we hope to see you again next month. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you very much.